So, thank you very much. I would firstly like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, the Ngunnawal people, whose land we're holding this forum upon. Um, and I'd also like to welcome everybody that has come here tonight, um, students, esteemed guests, and particularly those that have travelled from afar to be here tonight. Um, we've got some fantastic international visitors that we'll be hearing from. Um, the Asia Pacific Learning Community is delighted to be hosting today's event as part of the Malaysia Singapore Update Forum. And uh, tonight with us to host the, uh, to be the Master of Ceremonies for tonight is Professor Anthony Milner. Um, Anthony Milner is an uh, esteemed scholar in the area himself and he will be managing some other very interesting conversations. So please um, enjoy the evening and we'll have questions at the end. Um, the topic, Malaysia and Singapore models for the Asian century, um, it seems to me the Asian century is a phrase we've got a pause on that in this. Um, Greg Lopez in that uh, session this morning asked how, how do we go about saying on what basis, I suppose, what is good and what is not good when we're making analytical judgments of uh, Malaysia or Singapore. Um, and we're dealing here with two countries which um, we had a particular, we Australians had a particular perspective on decades ago uh, at the very beginning of their creation, Australia playing quite a role at that stage. It's now a totally different situation where we've got countries with much larger economies, larger populations, and uh, particularly, I think, in the case of Singapore, larger military forces. Uh, these are countries to be reckoned with. This is, uh, if I respond to Andrew McIntyre this morning, we're thinking about Malaysia and Singapore these days in a very different way. The way we would have thought about Malaysia and Singapore when he was talking about it in the 1940s and 50s was in terms of how we help the development, the creation of these countries, what role we would play in nation building. We're now thinking on what basis, well, that's how I understand this title, in an Asian century, unlike a, uh, if you like, Western hegemony moment at the end of the Second World War, in an Asian century, how do we go about making those judgments? So in asking this question about uh, Malaysia and Singapore models, um, I think we have to keep in mind that, that vantage point. What is the vantage point? We need to reflect on that. Now, a number of different uh, my, uh, colleagues have uh, been asked to approach this question from different perspectives, and uh, each of them has a title there. I'm not quite sure how I see all those particular topics tying into this topic, this overall overarching topic, but I'm sure they'll achieve that. Clive certainly will, and we'll start with Clive. Once again, many thanks for inviting me, for be ready, being ready to listen to me. I take my hat off, as you've seen already, to those of you who have come back for some more this evening, and those who know me well know it's a very rare occasion indeed if I do take my hat off. Wearing a hat is an inherited genetic condition with me. Um, I also um, trust that I will uh, be a little less erratic and irascible than I was this morning, but I do sometimes get overcarried away in my enthusiasms. I shall try to remain within the tight constraints of the time available. Malaysia as a model, a model of what? In my brief pressy of what I was going, what I decided I would try and discuss, I said, Malaysia offers itself internationally these days as an exemplar of religious and political moderation and of the successful accomplishment, at least in prospect, on the road, the successful accomplishment of modernity in an Islamic form, on an Islamic basis, and in, and in Islamic terms, Malay Islamic terms. In short, as a model of successfully achieved Islamic modernity that other developing Islamic nations might emulate and that the non-Muslim world should acknowledge and respect. My brief discussion will question these claims both historically and on the basis of recent empirical research. I do believe that there is something 
an attitude of mind, a stance towards the world that we might characterise as modernity, which means somehow or other standing within one's own tradition, understanding from within the terms in which the tradition works, a modern per in a modern person, the forms of thinking that are historically embedded in a, in a tradition become conscious, its operations are made conscious to itself in the minds of its self-aware or reflexive thinkers. And in that way, I believe that at least in principle or in prospect, there might be not one modernity, but many, that modernity might be achievable and is ideally should be achieved within any and every civilizational tradition. I believe that the grounds for an Islamic modernity are there because Islam has a very deep, deeply rooted, a historically valued intellectual tradition that if only people could master it properly would be the basis of an Islamic modernity. And is a tradition not, is not a way through which one sees the world, but a modern person sees the evolution of his or her, their own tradition, from the perspective of the world, rather than seeing the assumptions, using their own, being enclosed, immured within their own tradition, and using that as a self-referential basis for understanding everything that's beyond it. Now, that may be a little bit high abstract, and so on. let me say what I might mean concretely by an Islamic modernity and why it is not only possible, but I think needed in Malaysia. The basis of a culture of Islamic modernity was articulated philosophically by the Kaum Muda, the followers in Malaysia or the elaborators within Malaysia and Singapore of the classical modernist intellectual revolution of Muhammad Abdu and his followers in the Middle East. This was a tradition that contested the conservative, palace-based, Istana-focused Islam of the rulers. It was an Islam that was marginalized in the Malay states that could thrive for a while only in the straight settlements where there was no local sultan and dependent class of conservative religious functionaries to squelch and crush it entirely. A, a tradition that from these marginal, the periphery of the Malay states, from the straight settlements, tried to project into the Malay world a, the basis of a culture of critique, a culture of modernity, but it was a tradition that, as Roth's classic analysis explains, and Tony Milner's own work uh, following it gives a different account in many ways of the same process, a tradition that was either on one reading marginalised and largely defeated, or from another point of view remained in play, remained imminent, remained embedded in the situation, but certainly uh, not the dominant one, one that was often contested and overridden by others. I do believe that such a tradition of Islamic modernity is essential in Malaysia today and has been ever since independence. The only way, the only basis on which I believe you can create national unity in Malaysia is to find a form, uh, is not by you know, radical secularism that repudiates religion, but in a modern Islam that, is a, that, can, that can be the basis of uh, mutual respect and engagement, if not agreement, between different kinds of Muslims, uh, Malays and non-Malays, believers and non-believers, the only basis upon which a modernizing, progressive, centrist Malay national leadership can hope to lead Malaysia is from such a basis. Well, uh, I can elaborate that further, but I shan't. Let me then say something about the great work um, largely ignored, which is of Professor Riaz Hassan of Flinders University, first a book called Faith Lines and then a successor called Inside Muslim Minds. Faith Lines was, was a preliminary study of four Islamic societies, including Malaysia. 
inside Muslim minds of 17 societies. It's the kind of sociology that I sometimes deplore and sometimes admire, but I certainly value when I find it serviceable. And this one I find magnificently serviceable. Riaz Hassan, in short, I do, let me say, I do not equate modernization, the process of modernization, with, with modernity itself, although they are clearly related. In Riaz Hassan's analysis, an empirically based the detailed studies of Muslim, Muslims, middle class Muslims in particular, in um, these 17 countries. And he then sets out all the data he's collected on two axes. One of socio-economic modernization, this is the way the pattern falls out, and the other is of attitudes of intellectual and cultural modernity. He has those two axes, and by and large you can draw a graph from the bottom left-hand corner up to the top right-hand corner, so that it shows that the more economically modernized, socio-economically transformed a Muslim society is, the more its public opinion, its Muslim public opinion, will tend towards modernist attitudes. There is, however, one staggering and outstanding exception to this, and um, I won't ask you to guess, it is Malaysia, where you find that among middle class, even so-called middle class modernized Malays by and large, if on any range of, on a whole range of questions, and I urge you to read the book, about enforcement of Sharia law and hooded punishments and acceptance of non-believers or whatever it is, where the range of opinions may be on a 10-point scale from something like two to six in other societies, where two are the most modern and six are the more, uh, are the least, two are the least modern, and, well, let's put it the other way, where two are the most modern and six are the least modern, you get this odd thing that a lot of these Malay middle class supposedly modern are somewhere up about eight or nine. They are more conservative or less modern than the most modern, uh, uh, they are less modern than the less modern of the, of the less modernized societies. And this creates a, a question. Why is this so? Let me give, uh, I think, uh, two answers to it, to I think how to reinterpret Riaz Hassan's findings. I can make only sense of this in only one way. And, whenever, and I've said this, spoke, I've never written this up, I've given, spoken to this in, on occasion, I said, I can't think of another reason, another explanation. This is my explanation. If anybody doesn't like it and wants something better, please volunteer a better explanation. My explanation goes as this, that basically Malay modernization has been produced and generated and underwritten by non-Malays, by the general economic and social dynamism of non-Malays, for which Malays, Malay Muslims have been the beneficiaries they have, but they have been neither the producers nor, we would say, the, the producing and self-transforming self products of, of Malay modernity, of an Islamic modernity. That somehow or other, the economic and social dynamism generated by non-Malays and non-Muslims has allowed and underwritten the possibility of many Malays uh, not only not to modernise, but to cling in a very sentimentalised or fetishised or neo-traditionalistic way to maintain an attachment to non-modern and even in many ways anti-modern attitudes. The, historically, how has this, has this been so? Well, certainly the whole history uh, of modern Malaysia, modern Malaysia, as I've observed it, while it's not been easy to be in opposition from one point of view, from another point of view on this area, the government has been not only kind, it's been extraordinarily generous to its opponents. It has created time and time again, from Pusat Islam that's become Jakim to the International Islamic University to Ikim, a whole range of, of institutions that were meant to be the powerhouses to generate this new Islamic intellectual consciousness, this new Islamic culture of modernity, a new Islamic intellectualism that would be the rival, the alternative, the counterweight to traditional conservative Islam. And yet all of these institutions were handed over to people who came from exact, who, who did not begin to understand what they needed to understand in order to be able to do the job that they were appointed to do. In fact, they all had the same kind of conventional background as the people in the traditional organisation. And to be appointed uh, in, Mala in the Malaysian society, people had to be politically, the, those in power had to be sure these people weren't going to, weren't going to be tearaways. And so they ended up appointing um, 
they ended up appointing uh, what, clones of the very people uh, that they were supposed to replace. And so you had basically the same kind of Islamist, conventional Islamist mentality, some of whom were in pus in the op opposition and others who were, became entrenched and embedded within all these official government institutions that were supposed to be the alternative um, uh, and were just pushing the same agenda from within rather than from without. That is the, my interpretation of that. I'm nearly ended. Uh, let me say finally uh, that that history continued and its most spectacular exemplar was Abdullah Badawi's initiative of Islam Hadari, which strategically was exactly the right thing to create the basis of a new civilizational intellectual Islam. The problem was that nobody really understood what doing that entailed. The people appointed to do it did not begin to understand the challenge they faced. And of course, they made it, they flubbed it. And in the end, as I put it in, in one of my articles in the old ASEAN analysis, and then again in the uh, Sharing the Nation, Islam Hadari became, in the end, an intellectual orphan. It was completely ungrounded. There was no foundation for it. Now, that is my analysis of the failure of the creation of the kind of Islamic modernity that I think has been all along and still remains essential to any attempt by UMNO or anybody else to rule Malaysia from the centre with a strong Malay base uh, on a base that recognises the importance of Islam but is able to, to develop and construe and configure Islam in a way that is creative intellectually for Mal Malays and non-Malays alike, Muslims and non-Muslims alike, and can be, be the, become the basis for the political incorporation of all, Malay, non-Malay, Muslims and non-Muslims, in a Malay-centric nation characterised by, not by Islamic law or Islamic state, but a kind of mobilising progressive Islamic social consciousness and the action born of it. Thank you. Uh, that, that's really thought-provoking, uh, Clive, particularly your response to Riaz Hassan. Um, so very much on the topic of is Malaysia a model of Islamic modernity. Let's turn now to Masuki Mohammed. On, is political change unfolding in Malaysia and will this political change lead to regime change? Thank you, Professor Kessler. And, uh, well, basically, uh, when Greg emailed me and asked me uh, what uh, I would like to talk uh, this session, I scribbled something uh, quite a few, one short color, few sentences, and in one of these uh, sentences is this Is political change unfolding in Malaysia? And will this political change lead to regime change? At that time, I just answered straight away. A political change, yes. Regime change, not too sure. Uh, it, is, it seems to be quite, quite an easy question to answer. But when I think again and again, it is not that easy. Number one, how do you define political change, whether political change also equals to regime change, or political change will lead to regime change, or can it be used interchangeably. Now I have to define it first. Uh, when I talk about political change, basically it refers to the changes that are happening in the, in the society, as well as in the, the political sphere, both politics and, and politically. Now, politics as we understand it, politicking more about the behavior of, uh, of politicians in a particular context at a particular time. And well, regime change, of course, what I mean is uh, a change of government. Right. Uh, whether 
there is a political change unfolding in Malaysia, I will say yes. Why? If you look at the way the, the politicians behave, the way the politics is perceived, both by those in power, those who govern, and also those who are governed, I mean, by the politicians themselves, as well as by, by the people. And you see a lot of uh, what you call this uh, uh, new thinking, not only new thinking, but in terms of actions on the ground. But I'm sharing with you, I'm not going to be too academic uh, tonight, but just to share some of uh, my experience um, working in Putrajaya as well as when we go to the ground, meeting the people, and things have changed. Experience uh, participating in election campaigns. Well, previously, if you look at the uh, literature on Malaysian politics, the word is be and sure win. We talk at, huh? this is this is sure win. It's just, just about it's about the margin. Not even the margin, it's how big two thirds majority that you can win. The two thirds majority is is always uh, secure. Like in Sarawak, for example, before you look you look at literatures on Sarawak politics, be and sure win. But the previous uh, Sarawak election, I would say that politics has become more and more competitive now, Malaysian politics. Well, Malaysian elections per se, for example, has been very competitive. But now we can feel that it is even more competitive. Uh, say, for example, the last uh, count, after the 2008 general election, we have 18 by-elections, 9 won by Barisan National, and 9 won by the opposition. And if you look at the, uh, the way the Barisan National uh, parties campaign in election, well, there are a lot of I mean, uh, people are talking about this and that in terms of the, uh, the dominance of Barisan National. I would say that if Barisan National is over-dominant or too dominant, that they don't have to campaign that much. But the way when you follow the, the campaign trail, it's almost 24 hours, meeting the people, hit counts, gathering feedbacks. And you do a lot of things to, what you call this, uh, to get, uh, or to, uh, to approach voters and to get their votes. Similarly, on the other side of the political divide, they do the same thing as well. So politics has become very much, very much competitive. And I would say that uh, this so-called uh, the new uh, what we call this a dimension in the electoral contest, where the election becomes more competitive. If you look at it from the positive side of it, then you will see that it moves both the government and the society into a more democratic direction. And I would say that this process is irreversible. Why? Say, for example, if you look back a few decades ago, and you compare it now, I've mentioned this morning, you find that people are more educated, people are becoming more urbanized, people have access to information, if previously you can just control the media, for example, printed presses, 
Now it doesn't work anymore. Uh, someone told me that uh, the Udusan Malaysia circulation has increased by 10%. But at the same time, those who access information on, on the web has also increased. The latest count was told at 30%. And most of them are young people, those in urban centers, those who have access to this. Uh, uh, oh, internet, news portals, and whatnot, social media, Facebook, Twitter. So this is on the rise. And I will say that this is irreversible. The process of, of the social change is irreversible. And as uh, probably Bridget uh, mentioned this afternoon, it is also the government owns making. You put the rapid economic development, you invest more on education, people become more educated, people become more urbanized, and it's just a natural process, a natural process that middle class will be expanding, and then you, the whole process will of course drive the government to be more democratic. Well, time is up. Give me two or three more minutes. Now, my, my point is, political change is real. The society has moved into a more democratic direction. If the government wants to get people's mandate, the government has to respond to these changes. There is no two ways about it. And when I talk about government, as I mentioned this morning or this afternoon, both by the national government as well as the government uh, at the state level, you know, ruled by the opposition political parties at the federal level, Kelantan, Penang, Selangor. So, politics becomes more contentious, and government has to respond more to these changes in the society. But will there be regime change, as, as in what we call this uh, change of government? I would say not too sure. So people are saying, you know, even this afternoon we uh, heard about well hung parliament is about if be and ever win, it is only marginal, or if opposition wins, it is also marginal. There will always be uh, possibilities of defections and whatnot. I mean, it's all these stories we heard. But if you ask me sincerely, of course, as a a BN supporter, I would say, BN will win. Right? No two ways about it. And I want BN to win. But, as politics becomes more competitive, I think the sensible answer that I can give is not too sure. We have to work harder. We have to meet more people. We have to convince them that this government is a better government. Because, what people want is basically not change of government. What they want is better government, better governance. And, okay, because time is up, I think uh, we save this. Uh, we, can, we can discuss later at the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Yeah, I suppose, um, I suppose one question is, is how, how whether people can conceptualize regime change uh, in Malaysia. I mean, to some extent, it's an advantage for the incumbent government that there's a confusion between party and state, and even the way history is taught in Malaysia. So I suppose I, I'm just wondering how, uh, well, perhaps we can talk about this later, but uh, is it becoming the sort of society where, you can con where many people could conceptualize regime change even if they want to go on supporting this government, this party. Um, let's turn to Singapore and uh, to turn to the Singapore economy. Um, and really, the, the big issue is what are Singapore's secrets to success? Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a question that's going through Australian cor corporate minds as well. Um, so, can I ask uh, uh, Chandra Tangavu? 
Jonathan Gavallo. Right, back up there. I have never given a talk in the evening, and, uh, and also in a podium, you know? uh, it looks very strange to me. And I don't even have my slides out, uh, I prepared my slides. Anyway, I, don't, I will not waste my time. Okay, um, it's, it's an interesting question. Uh, the question they give me was, uh, is there a Singapore model? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, there's no such thing as a Singapore model. And I don't think so there is uh, even a Malaysian model or ASEAN model. Uh, but uh, I can highlight certain uh, key fundamentals uh, that drive uh, certain growth uh, in the region and also uh, drives the growth uh, of Singapore economy. And um, the way you're going to think about uh, how ASEAN is growing, how Malaysia is growing, or how Singapore has grown uh, is based on uh, certain factors, parameters are already given to us. We have no control over these parameters. One uh, parameter is uh, we, don't, we are very scarce in land, we don't have any natural resource, uh, and we are strategically located in the east-west trade routes. And this is already given to us. So the natural question then was how to grow given these constraints. So what are the choices I have? What are the choices where a person can use to manage the economy and grow to the maximum? So I can think of five choices uh, at every point in time or, uh, that drives the, the, the Singapore economy. And this was thought of from the beginning. Uh, first one is uh, stable institutions. Uh, the, the idea of stable institutions is, is quite broad. So you can have uh, several subgroups in the stable institution. A good example is uh, make sure that you don't, is corrupt free. Corrupt free economy is very important because uh, from the beginning they knew that uh, uh, in an open economy you want to drive growth and you want to drive export growth, you need a very corrupt free institutions. If not, there's going to be a lot of rent seeking. So they set up a stable institution, and the key idea of stable institution is actually allows you to hedge your risk. What is this hedging of risk? Hedging of risk is very important because one, you want to live in any economy, you're going to hedge current future consumption, future savings, uh, with current consumption, current savings. So it allows you to smooth your consumption and maximize your standard living. And the other aspect of stable institution is, this afternoon we talked about that, is the trickle-down effect. Any growth you want to have, the institution must redistribute the wealth such that uh, there is more equity in the, in the economy. In the 70s and the 80s, uh, the equity issues and driving employment issues and driving uh, standard living issues was much more easier. The second one is, um, stable and strong infrastructure. So if you go to Singapore, it's very easy. You go to Singapore, every five years we change the, the, the infrastructure. New infrastructure is always coming up. They're always changing a building. Sometimes you ask, when I'm driving down the highway, I will always ask myself, why are they digging a hole here and digging a hole there? Right? What kind of employment are they going to create? No? So this taxi driver told me, so uh, this kind of public construction is very important because it, it shows the government is doing something to the economy and is very visible. You know, so the perception is uh, whenever they are digging something, when you got inconvenient, you know the government is doing something. You know? So uh, that's that is his argument. But actually, sorry. So uh, actually, the the government. Uh, put in very good infrastructures, uh, whether it's now we are talking about 4G, they're going to 4G, they want to connect everybody and fiber optics, now uh, uh, fiber optics is coming to my TV, I'm already linking up smart TV and so on and so forth. So they're trying to reduce the cost and try to introduce technology as fast as possible, uh, not only to the businesses but individual households. So again, infrastructure allows us to maximize our return in terms of economic growth and standard of living. So that is the second choice variable they had from the beginning. So they keep changing it. The third one is um, openness. And this parameter was already given to us uh, from 
and the early 19th century we are open trading place so we always very open so what the government did was make sure that the openness is enhanced by having the lowest tax rate so the highest tax base you're going to have in Singapore is most is 20 percent the highest that means the highest person will only pay the maximum 20 percent and in businesses are given a lot of subsidies and tax holidays and so on so that uh, uh, you enhance the openness with uh, more fiscal policies and of course the, the, the other thing if, with uh, uh, the openness is you have to be pro-business you have to be pro-business if you want to be open you have to be pro-business so this is another choice they have and not only they want to be pro-business but they also allow businesses to participate in, in the decision making, the tripartism and so on and so forth. Okay. The last, the next one is human capital. It's very, very important for us. And the evolution of the way institutions are set up in terms of human capital is changing over time. So initially, we moved up very fast from creating employment to secondary education to uh, uh, institute of technical education. So nobody is leaked out of the system. And now we are building five and fifth universities so that we want 40% of our cohort to have university education. The last one, I think the choice variable is the way they plan. You go to Malaysia and Singapore, you will have a five-year plan, a blueprint, what the economy should be, a 10-year plan. And even I have been asked to make a forecast what the economy will be in 2050 to 2060. They want a vision, they, they, they want a scenario, they want different scenarios so that they can make a choice. And that is again a fundamental of how the model itself works. If I have these five choice variables, what are the problems, what are the challenges we have? Uh, I will go through each of them. The first one is a stable institution. Increasingly, uh, our, uh, although our institutions are still very strong, some questions has been raised. Uh, the, the, the one of the questions we had in terms of uh, our institutions are uh, we must grow at whatever the cost is because you're open economy, you're pro-business. So when you're pro-business, you will drive growth to the maximum. That means you invest in human capital, you invest in infrastructure, you will bring in MNCs to drive growth as fast as you can. Again, we had this discussion, this drive in terms of investment and growth uh, is driving the higher 20th percentile income faster because we are already moving to a frontier where uh, uh, we still don't have the growth but the, the, the trickle down effects are much, much lower. And uh, not everybody has the skills, it's going to take a longer time to acquire the skills, so the skill gap is widening. So the social dimension of how our institution is going to deal with this becomes very, very important now. Uh, whether it's income equality or uh, the aging population or uh, how uh, uh, the vulnerable population, even we are talking about um, uh, working poor. So you might be working, but you are still poor, below the poverty line. So we define a poverty line maybe 1,200 to 1,005. So you are still working, but you are considered poor. So that is one challenge which we are facing. The second one is again going to infrastructure. It's very scarce land. So what, one of the things we have done is increase the uh, population size. So our MRT subways are getting very, very crowded. So people are asking questions. Uh, are we getting the maximum from, from our infrastructure? especially the subways, the roads, is, it is getting very, very congested. Uh, it normally takes me 10, 15 minutes uh, to get from where I am uh, to the university. Uh, but that's only a certain period of time. If I go morning from uh, 8 to 9, it would take me 45 minutes to an hour to reach my, my office. That frustrates me because it's taking my time away from doing a lot of things. So the call is a stable and strong institution which is supposed to increase the return is creating a cost to the economy now. The third one is openness. Initially when we started doing openness, we invited uh, multinationals, we trade, we drive growth and so on. The, the other thing we realized is that one, multinationals, when they set up, uh, they also become very fruitless. 
That means they move out of the economy fast. As, as they, 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 they move in very fast, they also move out very fast, especially at a high value added activity. So we start experiencing more hollowing out effects, especially after each, each crisis. And again, the government started thinking how to keep MNCs. So one of the strategies was not only create my own technology and focus on three important sectors, electronic, pharmaceutical, and chemicals, so that I can diversify my exports. But at the same time, uh, try to allow uh, semi-skilled and unskilled workers to come in to hold on to the MNCs, so I can manage the holding out effect. That's one aspect. The other aspect which recently we have experienced is we are experiencing more external shocks because we are very completely open. The external shocks, the monetary shocks and the financial shocks are really creating a lot of instability uh, in our economy. Especially, uh, we are finding it very difficult to manage our exchange rate now, the exchange rate policy. So again, uh, openness has been questioned. How much should we open and which kind of multinationals should we attract and so on. The, the next one uh, is human capital. Uh, it's easy to increase your human capital to primary school, easy to increase to secondary school. But at the higher level, you not just want to educate the person, but you must, must make sure the person drives innovation. And increasingly, we find that that is becoming very, very difficult. Uh, one, to set up the institutions, it takes time. Two, to educate a person is very costly. And three, it takes a longer time to actually increase the supply in human capital. As opposed to the way that when you open, industries move in very fast and move out very fast. So again, uh, the demand is rising faster than supply. So one of the strategies was to narrow this skill gap as fast as possible. The last one was the planning and forecasting. The planning model and the forecasting model increasingly getting much more difficult because the, as you get closer and closer to the frontier and become more open, it becomes very noisy. That means uh, which kind of skills you're going to develop your human capital. It's a very interesting question and a very good question. By the time you develop a person, 20 years investment in a person and develop the skill, that skill becomes redundant by the time that, that particular individual gets in the market. So it becomes very noisy because skills are changing very fast. Look at the iPhone. They're already introducing iPhone 5. And we are still working on iPhone 3. I'm still working on iPhone 3. I have iPhone 4 or whatever. But I still don't understand the technology. So technology is changing so fast that our human capital have to catch, is now catching up. In the 70s and 80s, uh, technology was catching up with our human capital. So we attracted a lot of very good MNCs. Now our human capital is trying to catch up with the technology. And we don't have the innovative, indigenous you know, innovation. This is not just Singapore, it's also Malaysia. In ASEAN itself, the next phase of growth, I think, will come from SMEs. The SMEs will be very important to create the production value chain and the network economy which we really, really need to drive. And that again uh, becomes very important. For, let me finish finally. Uh, whatever I said here in terms of the choice, the five choices and the problems I have, uh, the most important part of uh, solving a problem is recognizing the problem. And uh, the government has recognized this. The issue is uh, there are a lot of noise and uh, the, the choice they're going to make become much more difficult because from the beginning when you start growing, your growth becomes path dependent, your institutions become path dependent. And this is what uh, Lily was talking about, that you have an institution and when you liberalize, you create frictions. So you become so path dependent on going on a certain trajectory that to change a trajectory is going to cost. It's going to be structural adjustments. And that becomes a very important uh, consideration at this time, how to change our path. Because it's so dependent for the last 45 years, we have grown in a certain, it can be called uh, benevolent dictator, whatever you want to call that. It's all path dependent. right? And it created growth, it created equality, and we have one of the highest standard of living in the world. So there's nothing wrong with that having a different trajectory that give us this growth. 
The question is, what is the next trajectory you want? Which is again goes back to these five choice variables. What are the five choi choice variables you're going to have? Each of them are not independent, they are interrelated, and how they're going to make this choice become very important. That is the growth in the next Asian century. Thank you. Hey, well, you've given us an in-depth answer to the question about the secrets of uh, Singapore's success. I thought you were simply going to say Lee Kuan Yew was the, was the, was the secret. Uh, Michael Barr may perhaps uh, put that argument. Thank you, Tony. Thank you for staying so late. I'm the odd one tonight. You're hearing four talks about countries and one about a person, Lee Kuan Yew. And there's a reason for that. I'm talking about the legacy of Lee Kuan Yew, and the legacy of Lee Kuan Yew is in fact embedded in a country. It is not the country itself, but it is an idea. Singapore as an idea, as a meme that Lee Kuan Yew has quite deliberately and consciously tried to spread throughout uh, the developing world and to try to get traction in the West, the US, Europe. Hence, when I was in Singapore giving a paper very much like this, in fact a much longer version of this paper, uh, that's where I picked up my Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy pen. They have a School of Public Policy which is training technocrats and bureaucrats and civil servants and academics and NGO people from places like Rwanda to spread the good word. The connection between Lee Kuan Yew and Singapore is so close that when I was giving that talk, the first question I got was basically a friendly attack saying, why are you talking about Lee Kuan Yew and I'm speaking of it as if it's a country? And then the second question I got, this is a paper about Lee Kuan Yew, was an emotional, emotional defence, not of Lee Kuan Yew, but of Singapore and its record, as if to just verify and confirm the fact that they have overlapped so much. Singapore has been constructed as Lee Kuan Yew's personal message to the world. Okay, so if we're looking at Lee Kuan Yew and his legacy, and that's what I want to do. The paper, the title that you've been given here is What is the Real Legacy of Lee Kuan Yew? The title that I've given this myself is Lee Kuan Yew's Enduring Legacies, and the paper that I gave in Singapore, I called that Lee Kuan Yew's global legacies. And that's really what I'm looking at. So I'd like to talk to you about for about the eight minutes that is left. See, when historians look back at the life and the achievements of Lee in, say, 10, 15 years, they'll potentially have quite a grab bag of legacies from which to choose. This is a leader who has been a success by every measure. He assumed the leadership of a tiny colony, led it to independence, vanquished his ideological enemies, outlived his peers, and bequeathed to subsequent generations a prosperous, affluent, stable society, as we've just heard. Whatever his detractors and critics might say, and I think I fit into one of those categories, and regardless of what future generations might bring, uh, future developments might bring, these achievements cannot be denied. They laid the foundation for his legacy, but I don't accept that they are actually legacies, his legacy in themselves. Nor, I'm sure, would Lee himself be satisfied with such a characterization, since they're all local, local Singaporean achievements, and he has always craved a bigger stage. After being denied Malaysia as his stage, he set out to elevate Singapore to become the template of an idea that could have global currency. I believe he's succeeded. This idea, the idea of Singapore, is premised entirely on the success of Singapore as a venture. Hence, those elements that I listed above are his as his local legacy. They are treasured by his family and probably by Singapore's constructed, well, certainly in constructed, Singapore's constructed memory. But if we're looking for signs of a global legacy, they're only the preconditions of being noticed and being taken seriously. If you are a success, if you have made a success of this, then people will ask, what is the 
Singapore model? What is the secret of success? And that's what he's interested in. Quite consciously interested in this and has always been interested in it. At this point, it would be relatively easy to construct an argument that presented the Lee legacy as, as a purely local affair and deny that it actually will have any lasting global influence. I think such a view would be incorrect and I think it will be proven incorrect in time. I see two primary elements of, in Lee's CV that deserve to be recognised as being both global and enduring in impact. They're not necessarily what you'd expect. First, being an effective, the effective inventor of state capitalism, an honour that he must share with his long-standing standing advisor and friend, uh, Dr Albert Winsemius of the World Bank, and his one-time right-hand man, Dr Goking Sui. And second, being the pioneer of a new and extremely sophisticated form of governance that scholars today variously identify with labels such as electoral authoritarianism and competitive authoritarianism. These achievements are closely related and both should be regarded as the foundation of a global phenomenon that have become mainstream and promise, or threatened depending upon your perspective, to become templates for normal business and governance in vast parts of the globe. Regardless of the contributions of colleagues and advisors, both of these elements are among those that are to be regarded as being most intrinsic to Lee's political and social thought at the deepest level, going back to his early days, going back to his days in the Cambridge Law School, going back to his days when he was a socialist. There are other elements that are even more deeply embedded in his political thought and his social thought, notably his racism and his elitism. And they are among the most uh, prominent of his local legacies. But if we're looking at the global, global level, I don't think they register, and I hope they don't register. The two global legacies that I've identified are, however, premised upon a conundrum that I don't believe that can be fully reconcilable. There is a basic conflict in the foundational logic of these two achievements. Both are premised upon maintaining extraordinarily high levels of professionalism and accountability to ensure responsiveness to changes, opportunities and challenges and freedom from inefficiency and corruption. Without those things, state capitalism won't work and authoritarianism will just degenerate into despotic governance. Secondly, both are also premised upon tight control of information, the political agenda and patronage, upon strong government and relative freedom from interrogation and accountability. The contradictions between these two things, one calling for tight control and the other one calling for high levels of interrogation and accountability, are painfully obvious when they're put in those stark terms. But it's not commonly realised the extent by those who watch Singapore from afar just how endemic the latter negative, if I can use that term, set of qualities are in the Singapore system. The significance of lines of patronage, freedom from interrogation, freedom from uh, uh, inspection, freedom from accountability, discretion in appointments. These things are so deeply woven into the fabric of Singapore Inc. that I dare say that if Singapore simply had on its books the concept of conflict of interest and the registration of conflict of interest and the impermissibility of conflict of interest, the system could not function. The levels of net networking, patronage, protection and consanguinity, family lines, are such that the professionalism that is needed to guarantee its success is severely compromised. The, promise that the problem is exacerbated by the fact that the higher one goes up the ladder of the elite, the closer one gets to the centre of power, the less accountability there is. 
and those with family connections suffer the least scrutiny of all. Such is the level of control of information and the regime of disciplinary regulation of public discourse that even in the more robust atmosphere generated by the stronger opposition presence in Parliament and the prevalence of the internet, it seems unlikely that this, this path, it seems likely that this pattern will continue into the long term with only minor modifications. To try to capture very briefly, sort of in a sentence, part of the conundrum that the, they're facing is they're trying to harness the all the advantages of freedom and creativity while still retaining quite tight control. They want creative and energetic entrepreneurship in the service of the state. Now, am I saying that these inherent weaknesses, and I believe they are inherent, in the joint system of authoritarianism and state capitalism, they are one joint system, do they mean that it can be, do they mean that they can be discounted into the long term despite their immediate currency? No, I'm not saying that. But I do believe that they will limit the effectiveness of both legacies and that both of the challenges, that most of the challenges to both systems will emerge as contradictions between these two impulses that are fighting against each other. Contradictions are natural in human systems. Most political and economic systems, and indeed most human systems, contain contradictions and tensions that, in inverted commas, logically should bring the system to an end. And yet many survive for generations or even centuries, adapting, compensating and adjusting to meet new, terror, new challenges. No system lasts forever, but I have no trouble envisaging a future where these two legacies endowed to us by Lee Kuan Yew emerge as major factors shaping 21st century, as significant rivals to liberal democracy and liberal capitalism. Gosh, that's a tough analysis, right? Uh, we'll come back to Lee Kuan Yew, I hope, and to Amno and make some comparative discussion, I hope, if we've got time, about the role of, these, of Lee Kuan Yew and Amno in their respective states. Um, let us now turn, finally, to Bridget Welsh for comparative insight into Singapore, Malaysian electoral politics and predictions. I mean, insight and predictions, or are you going to give us predictions? <laughs> I talked earlier today about dominant party decline, and uh, I'm not going to talk about elections, and I'm not going to talk about predictions. Uh, we've heard earlier from Marzuki that the BN may win. <laughs> he doesn't know. I think the answer is no one really knows. So, uh, what I'm going to do instead um, is to talk about these two countries and the cusp of change. And what I see, some of the lessons and issues that we need to look at as they move forward, as we look and reflect on them as Asian models. And I'm gonna just mention sort of five sets of points that I think are very important for us to look at and to ponder in a reflective fashion, building a little bit on similar points that was raised by Michael. But before I do that, I'd like to take a moment to wish Clive an early happy birthday. Uh, he's still young at heart and definitely young in mind. <clears throat> okay, what do I want to talk about? The first issue that in looking at Malaysia and Singapore is we have to recognize their success. But when we look at success, one has to appreciate that sometimes there are unintended consequences of success that create a challenge. Both countries are actually facing midlife transitions or tra and transformations. And with these transitions come real serious challenges and how to engage these things as a product of the very successes that they've had. The first lesson we learn is the centrality of governance. And when we look at both Malaysia and Singapore, we have a very dominant matrix that the government is the solution to the problem. When in fact, in many cases, huh, 
This may not be the case. But there are some very important lessons. We see that the successes of Malaysia and Singapore have come from good governance. And in areas particular of quality service provision, the building of infrastructure, the expansion uh, of the state into the areas of ad addressing questions of inequalities, these have been the lessons of the 70s and the 80s and the 90s in both countries. And we've seen as a product of that, because the state has played a prominent role, we've had prominent areas of economic growth. But the question is, can this particular model, a state capitalist model, actually be sustainable in this contemporary global century? There are two areas that I think are on the table. One has been mentioned by Michael, and that is you have the problem of that people now are very much vested in the state and they actually do not see the conflicts of interest of being part of the elite and the potential abuses of power that they come from being within this particular state apparatus. The second aspect of that, which is so prominent in the context of Malaysia, and we, by the way, prominent throughout Asia, and all survey data shows that the number one concern in the area of governance remains corruption. Now, how can you deal with these issues of abuse of power and corruption and, and, try, and try to improve governance? I don't have answers. I think I don't have a clear situation. But what I see in the lessons of both Singapore and Malaysia is that you have to have some sort of check on state capitalism, check on the government knows best, that there has to be some, as the societies evolve, into more checks from society itself. And I think this is going to be the next decade, the next half century of these countries, where you see the, the rise of the market and the rise of civil society as part of these checks in the way that these models move forward. And we're seeing this in other parts of Asia, Taiwan and Korea. I expect this will continue and expand within the context of Malaysia and Singapore. The second area that I think about when I look at the issues of the models of these two countries is the issue of equality. We have had, in both these countries, tremendous success. Education, class, mob class mobility, has been a feature of both societies, where you can see now first and second generation of people who have now gone on to university. Uh, and this, the NEP, for all of its detractors, in the 1970s and 1980s, profoundly transformed Malay and Malaysian society in very important ways. But what is happening now is actually since 1997, in a regional phenomenon in Asia, but particularly acute in Malaysia and Singapore, are rising comparative inequalities. The Gini coefficients are expanding, and every single report that is coming out, that's looking at these issues from government numbers, sees this as a huge red light, a huge problem that they don't know how to address. There is a discourse of this happening in Singapore, and there, is a, and there, was, there has yet to be a full discourse of this issue in the context of Malaysia. But when we look at the challenges for these models, ahead will be whether or not they can continue to actually create opportunities and deal with the issues of, it, of, of equality. In particular, in the case of Singapore, because it is such a small place, as in, not necessarily in terms of geography, it's a big place in terms of spirit, but in terms of geography, there are the real challenges that Singaporeans feel about having choices. Many of them are choosing to leave the system and leave the country because of the constraints that exist. We still have the similar dynamic of choices in the context of Malaysia. So the challenge here is how do you get to the questions of equality, especially for certain vulnerable groups. We now have studies in both countries that there are certain groups of people that are being left behind. We have intergenerational exclusion among certain sectors of society. And we have groups that involve social problems, mentally ill, that are being left to mind systematically as these countries are moving forward. And I think this is expanding the inequalities that exist within these societies because of this entrenched dimension. This needs a dialogue. The third area that is often touted about Singapore and Malaysia 
is the issue of ethnic stability, the sense that they have maintained ethnic harmony. My own view is that there's always an element of truth to this, but there's also an element of myth. And that in both societies, there have now been profound demographic shifts in the, way, in, the, in the shares of the different ethnic communities. In the case of Malaysia, it has to do with different birth rates among the communities. In the case of Singapore, it has to do with migration and, and of course, low birth rates. And with this, you have real challenges to deal with a new ethnic equation in the context of both countries. For example, in Singapore, you cannot talk about the same CMIO anymore in any real sense. And in the case of Malaysia, you have to talk, you actually are dealing with very smaller minority groups in terms of the overall population, and the ethnicity is transformed into issues that involve questions of religion and other different markers. The question now is how do you deal with ethnic exclusion in a, su in a substantive way in polities like these both that are extremely racialized? The Malay community in Singapore faces real challenges. The Chinese community faces systematic feelings of exclusion in Malaysia. The Karazan community in Sabah faces even higher levels in terms of their perceptions. When we look at these countries as role models, we must think about what are the solutions to these sets of problems. And in many ways, these things are not being discussed in any substantive way on both sides of the causeway. The fourth aspect that I point to when I think about these two countries as growth models and how they're moving to the future, and that is what I see as ideological splits. There is now a much more complex politics of religion in both countries. There's much talk of this in the context of Malaysia, the place where you know, issues of Islam and Islamic State and issues of theology and others are quite pronounced. But that's only a very small part of the discussion and discourse and the complexities of politics of religion in Malaysia, where you've had religious revivalism across the different communities, across Christians, across Hindus, and others. And that same dimension is existing within Singapore. You now have to deal with real ideological splits in, in, in these societies, and religion becomes where that becomes most manifested. You have different generationals of different practices of religiosity. Can these countries manage this new politics of religion? Not so easy. You have now new postmodern ideals. In both countries, especially in Malaysia, you have a new active environmental movement. Predictions. This will matter in seven seats in the election, and I can tell you which ones. <laughs> because you now have a, a, people who are very conscious of different sets of values. You have a green movement. This is the new parts of the new politics and identity. Sexuality, debates in Singapore, we've seen, can now we have rising debates of these issues in the context of Malaysia. This is all part and parcel of a new transformative dynamic of politics in both countries, of where Malaysia and Singapore will become close watched for the sense of how they manage these ideological divisions. I close now by raising the issue of elites. Malaysia and Singapore, in most of their decades, were very successful because there was respect for leaders. Sometimes they used fear to get that. Uh, but there was a sense of hierarchy, of sense of, accept, uh, of tolerance or acceptance of leadership behavior. In both societies, this has eroded considerably. There are very large trust deficits of all leaders, irrespective, across the political spectrum. This, and there has been a massive leveling where the leaders are seen as everyday politicians as opposed to people who are, can be insulated and to carry out policy away from everyday environments. This is the new politics, the much more difficult aspects of governance. Singapore and Malaysia will continue to be successes, 
But there has to begin by a recognition of the new sets of problems that they will face and the new challenges. And again, searching for these solutions are not easy. But I think if we continue to see politics in these countries only through old spectrums of race and, and elite rules and leadership without recognizing the transformations that have taken place from below and from these societies, we'll miss the point. We'll miss the lessons. I'll finish there. Michael's uh, comment, just let me ask you a question too, comment about Lee Kuan Yew and Singapore and the connection being so close. I wonder if Mazuki and, and, um, and Michael perhaps would both, would both talk about this. Um, I, mean, I suppose, first of all, I, 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 is there an assumption that in an Asian century, one of the features of our model would be that you could change governments, that you could change governments. And my question really is, is has AMNO succeeded in the Malaysian narrative of making itself so entangled with the government, the government itself, with status, status, that it's hard to envisage a, a change in government? Is that the same situation in Singapore? That, again, in the Singapore narrative, Lee Kuan Yew so central in the construct of Singapore state and state narrative. What difficulties does this, in both cases, provide for an opposition? It's one thing to, to vote a bit for the opposition as a protest, but to what extent in both countries are people beginning to feel they really could change governments? Okay. Um, the legacy of Lee Kuan Yew goes far beyond how he's actually viewed by the sort of current generation of voters. Uh, and oddly enough, one of the things that is happening is that locally his name is being relatively trashed because of, basically he stayed there too long. But we need to be careful not to judge Lee Kuan Yew by the, 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 the man he was in his last 10 years in government when he shouldn't have been there. He should have been home in his slippers. Last 20 years, I mean, goodness gracious, you know, when, well, in, in, the, in, the, in the 1980s, he was already in his 50s, 60s, I think, something like that. I don't know. At an age when he should be retiring. Now, I do believe I don't believe that it has reached the stage where they don't, where, where there is a model that ties a country intrinsically or naturally or that's how they see themselves to a person. But there is a model where they tie themselves to a system. And especially in a place like Singapore, where you have an elite which is beyond Lee Kuan Yew and which, is, which permeates the whole of society. Every aspect of decision making, every aspect of the economy. And it is, impossible, it is nearly impossible to imagine a change of government that in Singapore in the next 10, 15 years that could succeed because if an opposition were to win government and be allowed to govern, their real, their real opposition would not be the PAP in an opposition of parliament. It would be their elite in the judiciary, the military, in the government linked companies. And they are there to stay. They are, the system doesn't work without those people there and without those people working and working actively. And that is a problem and that is a real conservatism. And that is a negative conservatism, I think, that will make it harder for them to change and harder for them to make the changes that they actually do recognise needs to be made. But it's very hard to make changes if it means ending your own job and making yourself irrelevant. That's part of the problem that we have. 
What about, what about Malaysia? Yeah. Well, it's not an easy question. Uh, the people say that the only certainty in politics is uncertainties. So, uh, whether we want to tie a political party with the state. But I would say that in Malaysia, for example, there are experiences of change of government at the state level. Penang, Kelantan, Sabah, Islam, they change. But at the federal level, it's something, it's something different. It's always been certain in all this while. But when politics become more competitive, nothing is not in store. Now, if you compare, what, what are the challenge? Now, what are the challenge? Whether it's, it's possible or not, or not possible. To experience uh, the change of government. I think we have to look at both sides of the political divide. I would say that what challenge, the kind of challenge that Gaza National is facing now, on the other side of the political fence, they're also facing the same challenge. But my, yeah. um, but my question is particularly, but, but my understanding is that when Amno's uh, tendency in, in telling the narrative of Malaysia, for instance, is to see Malaysia itself as largely an Amno creation. Now, the historical record is a bit different. I mean, Amno is part of it, but it's not an Amno creation. Even the sultans are said to be given their position in some discussion, anyhow. Their position is ensured, it's supported, and uh, attributed to them by Amno. But um, Amno is seeing itself as pretty identical to the state uh, in the same way that we've just heard of in Singapore. It's, it makes it hard to conceptualize a state uh, neutral, separate from, uh, from the governing party. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you look at, I mean, you look from that angle, uh, you can see that Amno is very much uh, institutionalized uh, in terms of uh, what we call this, uh, the party itself, the closeness with the system, the state, uh, as well as the society. Uh, but again, uh, probably this is something that is good for Amno. Yeah. Uh, this is something that is good for Amno. You have this, uh, what we call this, uh, the benefit of incumbency. You also have uh, the benefit of uh, uh, what we call this uh, mobilization, organizational uh, uh, strength that you have in terms of how you mobilize the people that you have. You have this, uh, what we call this, uh, uh, advantages. Uh, it's good for the nation. It's good. good for the nation. It is. Well, it is very subjective. Yeah. It, is, it, is, it is very, very much uh, subjective. Yeah. All this while, yes, you have this, uh, the, the, the kind of the, the political structure. Let's look at example. Now, how are uh, what are all these, uh, uh, operate, uh, both at the operational level, both at the, the structural level? and how AMNO respond to the changes taking place in the society. Uh, even though that uh, we say that AMNO is having this, uh, what we call this, uh, the strength for the benefit of the currency with uh, the kind of uh, organizational structure, deep in the campos, up to the, uh, what we call this, uh, uh, the federal level, but what uh, will determine our most success in the future is how it transform the party. And how it transform the party and how it responds to the changes in the society. For mm -hmm. example, uh, recently there has been a work for this uh, a constitutional amendment where the party election will not be determined by just a couple of thousand who come to the General Assembly to cast their vote. But those at the different divisional level will also have their, their say. Yes. This is how Amno responded to change. And this you can find, say for example, in the Democratic Action Party. You cannot find it in uh, the, the party Ka'adilan Rakyat. You cannot find it in party Islam Islamism. But Amno has responded to this. So if you say, say for example, 
Now we talk about parties have to respond to the changes in society. We also look at how the opposition can respond to the changes in society. Has they, have they been responsive enough to warrant political change and regime change? So this is a, a serious question mark. People always look at UMNO. You don't look at PAS, you don't look at DAP, you don't look at PKR. Have they changed? Hey, thank you for that vigorous response. <laughs> Would anybody else like to come in on this or we... Uh, yeah, sure. I think that uh, there are just a couple points I would like to make. I think Marzuki is correct that I think there has been a democratization of the electoral process with the UMNO. And I do think that there has been a much more concerted effort to go into the election and, and, and work hard at many different levels. Uh, I think that that is a fair comment. Unfortunately, however, UMNO has not held its elections yet. We're looking at over three years before its, its last held its election. So we haven't seen some of those changes being brought into the party in any fundamental way because the elections have been postponed before the other elections. Um, I think the other issue that I think is a big challenge is that UMNO uh, is actually really ch dealing with a crisis of identity as it transforms itself uh, from the perspective of uh, what it stands for in terms of policies, what it stands for in terms of identity, in terms of Malay issues, in terms of religion. And I think can, you, can you say that? What, what do you mean? Well, I think, you know, <clears throat> there is a... What UMNO stands for in the society is really about incumbency as opposed to a party that has a clear sense of what its ideology is. Uh, and I think uh, you see, uh, for example, most recently, uh, you've had the Bulama UMNO members in Johor calling for Hudu, um, uh, which is, doesn't mesh with what has traditionally been within UMNO's secular position. Uh, in terms of questions of, on issues of religion. So I think there is a very unclear sense of what the party's identity is beyond being holding on to incumbent's sense of power. Yeah. I might just add to that. I think that UMNO has been enormously successful in transforming just about everything, or most things, or many things, in Malay society. The remarkable exception is it has not transformed itself. And this is, from one point of view, an anomaly, and from another point of view, um, the key national obstacle. Whether or not the other parties, Mazuki, have transformed is an interesting but very subsidiary question. What transforming UMNO means, means transforming a situation where the UMNO having been in, in power for half a century and more, where the state is like a glove that's made to fit one hand and one hand only, and it's the hand of UMNO, and where that hand is now, the different things of that hand are tearing the hand apart. And that is a fundamental, not just an issue about can parties transform, that's a fundamental question about the nature of the state. What makes the Malaysian state, I won't say peculiar, but interesting from a comparative point of view is that because of the underlying ethnicization, what I call that, of the whole political dynamic, you have this very peculiar interlocking nature, it gets back to, what we say back to some interesting, in between elements in state, party, civil service, government, judiciary, um, economic, national economic leadership. Um, police, security, all these things, it's a tightly interlocking network, all based on the notion that on the notion that there's something called a Malay position, whatever that might be, to protect, and that UMNO is the only successful guardian of that. And this gets to Brisbane, Brisbane that that rationale of UMNO has now become this uh, has become problematic and increasingly implausible to many of the people whom UMNO, to whom UMNO appeals. I'll leave it at that. Can we just put back to Chandra for a minute? Um, will you say something about this too? Uh, in, in your discussion of the economy, I mean, how much, how much of that world is actually independent of, separate from, separate out from, disentangled from the um, PAP elite? 
Yes. Uh, to me, it's quite interesting. Um, it's been a long, long time since I've heard a discussion about uh, mental minister Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, the, the, the reason why I say that is uh, if uh, um, in most discussions, uh, young people don't want so much discussion on the previous leaders. They want the current uh, political minds tell them where the next trajectory should be. So this discussion about uh, mental minister, uh, as if uh, the economy is based on him, uh, it's a bit dated to me. Uh, no offense to the discussions we made. What about if you just talk of the PAP and not yeah. about uh, these on yours? Yeah, but the PAP itself is in a transition. It is in a transition. Actually, it's, it's very interesting to see how the transition is occurring. It's occurring because of uh, two reasons. One is uh, the economy itself requires the, uh, the, the political mindset to change because of the social issues that are arising and the social dimension that is arising, which is uh, uh, it's something quite different from the way uh, the, the political party has been thinking about uh, how to manage the economy. They are purely pro-business. They are driven by pro-business and uh, the economy itself. So when they have to deal with these social I issues, there is uh, uh, certain conflicts that are arising. The second dimension that is really changing the political mind is the young people. Young people are really, really changing the way the political scenarios and the political equilibrium will change in Singapore. Uh, whether it's the, uh, the young through the uh, civil society or even the young themselves who are basically been traveling quite a bit. I would say by uh, uh, more than half uh, of our youth uh, should have traveled quite widely across the world and live across the world. So when they come back, they bring back more different kind of ideas that need uh, political shift. Because end of the day, uh, it's not the old people, which is again uh, the, the, the argument that old people will, basically they will go and vote for the current party, the incumbent party, it's very clear. The, the issue is the young, what is their mindset and will they vote for the incumbent? That is the challenge which uh, the current PAP government is thinking about, how to meet that challenge. And you can see the response they have in terms of uh, the members they bring in, in terms of uh, the uh, new, uh, uh, whether each minister has a Twitter, each minister has a Facebook. They respond to those Facebook and they, they rigorously, whether they respond or not, that I'm not sure, but uh, they do respond, and it comes on the paper, the minister responds and so on. So they realize that to meet this challenge of the changing mindset, not only outside, but within the, the economy, becomes an important challenge. So that is the new politics. There is a new politics in the new century, which is going to be much more interesting than going to change the equilibrium inside. So just Michael, Michael you started the Thank you. There is one uh, point of comparison between Singapore and Malaysia in this that really strikes me as I listen to the conversation around the table. In Malaysia, if UMNO changes, the country changes. That is not the case in Singapore. The party is just a vehicle for something much more important, much more uh, significant, and that's the elite. You go through the... Uh, you go through the... Uh, Civil service, you go through business in Malaysia, you find the PA, you find UMNO and the MCA. You go through business and you go through the civil service in Singapore, you do not find the PAP. Some of the, some of the government's most effective defenders are not members of the party, they are civil servants. They are invited over a cup of tea to join the party at the same time as they are invited to come into Parliament. The party is just a vehicle for something much more significant than Singapore. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Uh, can we, have you got another microphone moving around? Yeah, it's, um, others got angles on, on these two countries as ideal states. Yeah. Question two. If, um, everyone. We haven't discussed Kamal Ataturk yet. Would you like to do that? I'll take that part. That's on the point. Yeah. Can you do it? Yeah. I'm not about to discuss Kamal Ataturk, although Bridget will pro and others will probably want to talk about the extent to which the Turkish model or anti-Kamalism has now become the uh, the imagine uh, Malanka Kahadapa the new desired way forward of the oppositional Islamic forces. I once likened Mahathir's Mahathir's uh, uh, line or agenda to a kind of a utter Turkism. Uh, I believe he was not pleased with the comparison. Uh, I would say that in a sense, um, Singapore, no, again, don't quote me, because that's going to be a credit, but uh, uh, Singapore, what Singapore has achieved in, is the kind of the achievement of, of a kind of a sort of a, a bastard half brother to modernity. It's a kind of new high modernist authoritarianism of a very sophisticated um, and successful within certain within limits which are now being which have a certain successful kind. Um, I don't believe that um, um, Malaysia has achieved the kind of, uh, or is even on a trajectory to, at the moment, towards achieving the kind of modernity that it really needs and that, uh, that it imagines it aspires to. Let's just get that through. High modernist authoritarianism, is that right? Something like that, yes. Don't quote you. Well, you can, I mean, it's not in German, but Adolf Hitler would have liked the efficiency of the whole operation. <laughs> would the Asian century like it, which is our point? That's a serious question. It may be the future. I hope it's, I hope there's, I hope, as Bridget says, there are greater elements of liberalisation and checks and balances that will come in as countervailing forces to that high uh, quasi-modernist or, you know, authoritarianism. Mm. Yeah. Is that fair enough to, to say? I'd like to uh, thank all the speakers. Uh, wonderful. I wanted to revisit what Chair Professor Miller started off with in the first session, the idea of this national conversation. This is obviously with regards to the religion. He said that, uh, that the national conversation seems to encompass the whole of society. I just wanted to briefly preface my, my question and some comments. I think in Singapore and Malaysia, there's a very dynamic, dialectical relationship between the two. There's an intrinsic interlinkage between the two countries. I mean, Bridget talked about the fact that there are these long regimes with uncontinuous broken rule. And, and for better or worse, Amno and PAP have a lot in common. You know, Amno people, Singapore, the government PAP loves to look at Amno and say, look at this. You know, this race-based politics will not work here. But what is the extent of Singapore, Singapore's model is public relations and subtlety. There is the charades of meritocracy as people have written them in Singapore. There is still the big racial element here. I mean, you look at the immigration. There's a whole host of... They want to keep the ethnic uh, quotas in check as well in Singapore. 
Um, and I think that's a very interesting dynamic. Um, and I think in, in, in Malaysia there's a lot more of a vibrant civil society as compared to Singapore. So very quickly, I wanted to, the Prime Minister to be to talk about this national conversation with much fanfare. But it seems to be something that is still quite state managed. So to what extent is this national conversation something that is very sincere and substantive? Or to what extent is it a case of the kids knowing we've kind of lost the plot? I'm surrounded by a coterie of single fans. I've lost touch of the ground. I need to engage with the people in order to keep the regime in power. I would like to uh, get, especially get Michael and Bridget to begin on this. Thank you. National conversations, like all forms of consultation, take on a particular hue when they are conducted by those in power to those who don't have power. And the Singapore elite, while it got a shock last year, is really having trouble coming to terms with the fact that it, get, it can it can get things so wrong, and the habits of power are very deeply ingrained, very hard to shake off. And I don't believe that they are very well equipped to carry on what I think to, ca to, car to carry on the spirit of what they mean by that that expression, a national conversation. Quite frankly, I don't know what a national conversation is. I know what a conversation between you and me is. I don't know what a national conversation is. So, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't put too much faith in that. I think they would like to do it, but they want to do it and still keep control, which is a problem for everyone. I think, uh, just to pick up on the issue of inequality in a discussion, you know, a parent has a conversation with a child. Right? Um, two peers have conversations with each other. Right? Um, two parents have conversations with each other. I think there is an unequal discourse in the, in the national conversation you know, that is still based on a sense of uh, not uh, a, a real sense of uh, equality in terms of listening. The second aspect of the issue of the national conversation is who's in the table and who's being included in, uh, as part of it. And I think, as recently in recent press, uh, the question is whether or not the opposition in Singapore should be part of that conversation. Uh, what elements of civil society should be parts of that conversation? What, who is actually going to be included? What we've seen in the past in the PAP is that they get feedback from the converted. Um, and they listen to those that they think would want to hear from them and speak back to them. And they don't necessarily see the outer circles in the periphery. And I think this is the question of the inclusiveness of the conversation. The third thing is a conversation, you know, we can hear something, but we don't listen. We can interpret something through a particular lens, but we cannot understand. I think a conversation is not something that can be done in isolation from listening, empathy, and understanding. And this is where I think the challenges of the PAP faces are in basically being able to get out of their box and understand where the discourse is coming from and what are the reasons for that, and to challenge some of the assumptions of their governance. And this is the hardest part of the transition that the PAP is facing. Yeah, what she said. <laughs> Yeah, I'm really interested in that topic. Um, I think there's a real contrast between Singapore and Malaysia. And I think the Malaysian, we can't go into it now, what a national conversation might be, but um, listening is part of it. And it seems to me that one can show that a good deal of listening also goes on in Malaysia. But I know there's a great deal of passion that doesn't seem obvious. And secondly, it does seem to me to be much more inclusive in Malaysia. I don't mean it's a happy conversation necessarily, uh, but it's, uh, it involves lots of bodies. Um, so, next question. So, I'm saying questions, they can be comments too. And one just a short one for Manzuki. So, I'll start with a short one. Um, Manzuki, you speak a lot about 
political transformation and how Amo is changing and things like that. Um, I'm just trying to make sense of that comment on one hand and the other, which is started by your boss. You know, when the first call and mission began, you know, how does that make any sense? Okay, and the more general question, which I guess I want more comments from Chandra and Bridget. Um, there is definitely electoral disaffection, maybe even deep electoral disaffection in both Malaysia and Singapore. Uh, but I think this masks a, a deeper dimension of, of sort of like an assault on human dignity in both regimes, not respecting the individual citizen as a person. And viewed from this angle, the word success perhaps is not so appropriate for these two qualities about half century after their formation. And in a way, I think the thesis can be constructed that the story of Malaysia and Singapore 50 years later is actually one of two failed social experiments which began in 65. They decided quite aggressively to go their own ways press on in their, with their own ideas and it's sort of like um, hit the rocks of their and So instead of thinking of them as models, you could think of them as warnings about directions we do not want to traverse. So I think don't read too much into it. You don't make it a big problem. Mandela used to say that, and of course I've heard it second. So you see how Mandela got it. And you look at uh, I would rather judge a uh, statement by not just what a person says, but what he did. And uh, what influenced his decision. By you look at Malaysia, for example, as I said, for example, as a Minister of Education, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, as a Minister of Education. If you think that it is a zero-sum game kind of uh, statement, that Malaysia will always have what they want, and Chinese will never get what they want, he will never approve 2.4 billion ringgit a year. It is an annual budget to national primary schools, to the national primary schools. Right? In Singapore, it's a largely, so I don't mean anything. But you don't have, you don't have that. The government doesn't spend billion for Chinese education. You don't have it in Australia. But you have it in, in Malaysia. China is 30 percent, over 30 percent of the population. So what does this mean? What does this mean? It means that it means in a democratic setting, you cannot ignore any ethnic community. Not in Malaysia. You cannot ignore the Chinese in Malaysia. You cannot ignore Indians in Malaysia. You cannot ignore the Malays in Malaysia. When politics becomes so competitive, when you, when you find that in your own constituency, for example, there are 30% Chinese are voters in your constituency, you do ignore the Chinese. I mean, people talk about ethnic exclusion. What kind of ethnic exclusion? So I think Malaysian politics has moved towards being more, being more inclusive. Well, if you say, I would say I'm Malay first and Malaysian second, identity-wise. Identity-wise, I'm very rooted, deeply rooted in the Malay culture, Malay identity. I would say, well, I'm, I'm a Malay. But that doesn't make me less Malaysian. It doesn't make me less Malaysian. You can say you're Chinese first, Malaysian second. Does this make you Less Malaysian as a Chinese? I don't think so. You can say you are Indian first, 
and Malaysian second. Does that make you less Malaysian? Mahathir says Malaysian. it does. Mahathir says it does. Well, you can say that. I mean, anybody can say no, that. No, in, in right. his, in his uh, memoirs, he, he makes that exact... In his memoirs, Mahathir makes that exact point, that, that you need to be Malaysian first, and it does make you somewhat less Malay, less Chinese, less Indian. Nevertheless, he conceptualizes it completely in racial terms. Well, I think, I don't, don't take a, a particular set statement out of context. What I said just now, it is identity-wise. The problem is that, the problem is, because when you talk about model, for example, we think that there is only one model. Right? You understand this in a particular, from a particular perspective that this must be, must be the one and only one. But if you look at, say for example, this now, that particular statement, if you look at from the cultural perspective, not political perspective. It is not political. If, politi if that is translated into a political statement that will later on reflect policies that the government made, this is a very zero-sum game. And that is not sustainable in the Malaysian context. The zero-sum game politics is not sustainable. We just have to, to cater to the needs, to listen to the aspirations of people of various races of various religions.